Hello everyone. Do you find yourself frustrated tonight? Do you find yourself frustrated as you're watching this, this program, even if it's recorded? It may be that you have some situations going on in your life. You may have some people in your life that maybe you shouldn't. What do I mean by that? We will look at that next, uh, in a moment as we begin Journey to Healing. Welcome to Journey to Healing. Do you find yourself discouraged, troubled, in need of healing, but not sure where to turn? John Euler, a licensed professional counselor, is here to help. John has more than 25 years of professional experience helping people deal with the issues that keep them emotionally and spiritually stuck. There is help. There is hope. There is a God who loves you and wants to help you find peace and strength. And John Euler is here to help you find that on this edition of Journey to Healing. Hello everyone, I'm John Euler. This is Journey to Healing and we are in the midst of a series on grief and loss, an extended series, and I'm still trying my hand at the technology of things. So, But we're in an extended series on grief and loss. We are spending uh, a fair bit of time now going into a subject that very few people understand or realize that is connected to grief and loss. We're looking at the issue of boundaries, setting limits, with certain people in our lives. Now, how is that connected to grief and loss? Well, in two ways. One is certainly if you have situations in the here and now, primarily dealing with people that are keeping things stirred up in your life, are keeping things to where you are frustrated, one thing is for sure, you will never be able to heal the past because you can't get there. Meaning you will be so busy keeping things, uh, trying to keep things calm in the here and now to where you'll never be able to tackle the issues in the past. Another issue is if there is grief and loss, it will prevent you until it is resolved. It'll prevent you from being able to be fully emotionally present in the moment so you can begin to deal with what's going on in the here and now effectively. Oftentimes we are reacting out of our past in the present. Now, what do I mean by that? Murray Bowen in what's called extended family systems therapy came up with a great term. He used the term emotional reactivity. I love that term because uh, it has to do with me, though I may be very intelligent, something is overriding me to cause me to override my intelligence. So I'm saying things that I later regret. I'm saying things that are maybe causing me to win the war but lose the battle. Maybe causing me to make sure I'm right, even though I may be dead right, meaning at the, at the expense of relationships that really are important. Oftentimes that's ego in the mix, but certainly if you have been hurt in the past, if you've been wounded, and if you've just stuffed stuff, now let's say you left home. Sometimes as I'm working with folks, as I'm taking a personal history, their personal history, I will ask what time, what age were you when you left home? Or it'll come up as they're describing when they got married. Sometimes you can tell a lot about someone or their situation depending upon when they left home. For instance, if somebody left home at age 17, and if you're in a country where the legal age, as far as uh, becoming an adult, is 18, as it is in the U.S., then the question is, why did you leave at 17? How was that arra arranged? It probably wasn't the norm. There was something going on that was intense enough to where things were bumped forward. If you have someone, for instance, that left home on their 18th birthday, 
that may be an okay thing, but oftentimes, because that's pretty abrupt, unless it was planned for, but then, again, what was going on at home to where you had to leave home right on your 18th birthday? So oftentimes, if somebody left home literally on their birthday, usually that means things were not going okay. Because if you can't wait a day or two or longer uh, to do a smooth transition, what it probably means is something was not okay and you were leaving to go somewhere or to go to someone else. Um, sometimes uh, young, young people go into the military at age 18. You can tell typically then that something's going on. Either you have an extremely patriotic young person or they're having to or they're wanting to leave and that's the only option or one of the options they, they select. So the time as far as chronology, so chronologically, when did someone leave home and how did they leave home? Was it a smooth transition or was it abrupt? And Murray Bowen uses the idea that emotional reactivity means some part of me on some level is not settled and therefore I am not responding, but I am reacting. I think I'm choosing, and of course I am choosing, but is it well thought out? Or am I being driven by emotions? And you can be driven by emotions in one of two ways. We tend to think of emotional reactivity, or when you hear that word, you tend to think of, or most of us, think of somebody that's escalating very quickly. It certainly encompasses that. But it can also be uh, due to somebody shutting down just as quickly. So if you have someone in your life, or if you yourself, that tends to shut down immediately, and they're not going to talk, and let's say not because of they're trying to put somebody else through the ringer, because that can be a power move. Sometimes the strongest person in a fight is the person that's not saying anything. So that can be a tremendous power move by a passive aggressive person. You can control an entire family by your silence. That's actually probably the most sophisticated of all methods. It's one thing to become verbose. It's one thing to become loud. It's one thing to become emotionally uh, escalated as far as volume. But it's when somebody shuts down on purpose now to make another person pay, that's, uh, that's it's really bad. It's almost diabolical, meaning without a word, you can make people squirm. And that, as we have referenced in the past, uh, on past episodes, so past uh, ep uh, podcasts, which as a matter of fact, you can find the growing collection. It's now becoming a repository of past programs on survivorsupport.net under the podcast tab. And we talked a lot about and have built the case and made the case for having limits, having boundaries, because oftentimes underneath that which is creating anxiety or depression or panic attacks or compulsive behaviors, oftentimes there's somebody in that's, that person's life that is crossing boundaries that is preventing them from having their own opinion, their own preference. And we referenced in the New Testament, we referenced Jesus's words from Matthew chapter seven, verse six, which says, do not cast your pearls before swine. Just prior to that, he says, don't take what is holy or special and give it to dogs. In that context, in that culture, dogs roamed the streets like a third world country. So that has to do with don't give that which is special to somebody outside the home. Don't give that which is special to somebody inside the home if they have demonstrated that they are a pig or a dog. And we defined that. You can find that in a previous, ep well, a number of previous episodes. One is um, how big of a pig. And we go through, we have an assessment. As a matter of fact, then we have the warthog assessment. So we have a couple of tests, a couple of assessments that you can go back and look. Why is that important? Because if I grew up in a home with someone that was adept at selfishness and hiding their selfishness and being able to use their selfishness, selfishness in ways that 
really started to suppress who I am, then I didn't have a chance to develop normally. I didn't have a, a chance to go through the normal stages of emotional development. Oh, I may have grown intellectually, I may have grown physically, but the question is, have I grown emotionally? One quick way to find out is, when frustrations arise, do I find that I'm able to hang in there long enough to work things through? Am I able to allow somebody else the space they need to work out their own problems? Do I get sucked into issues? Do I re react quickly? Does tension cause me to do something stupid or foolish? Right? Or I, I tend to, or here it is, it, does my stability depend upon somebody else's stability? And that gets really tricky because in a family, we all affect one another. Codependency, you may be familiar with that term. That's simply a little a psychology term or pop psychology, but there's nothing wrong with the term. It's been around for, for a while now. It simply means that I am as emotionally stable as someone else is. That is very tricky. Because if you're married to someone who is emotionally unstable or emotionally selfish or selfish and therefore uses their emotions in a way that manipulates people, if I'm not okay with them being not okay at a very foundational level, then I'll be a wreck. I will find that my anxiety goes up. I'll find that I'm not able to be about the business of, of life and doing what I need to do. All my energies will go where? My focus will go where? Uh, my attention will go where? Trying to fix that person, trying to make it okay. Think about alcoholic homes. Alcoholic homes presuppose somebody's an alcoholic and the spouse and kids, their life revolves around what? Trying to make the alcoholic sober, trying to make the alcoholic okay. So if somebody, if a person in a family can begin to control a family through their moods and their attitudes, then you have a very toxic situation where no one will benefit. So we've been looking at the effects of that. We've been looking at what happens if you've grown up in that kind of environment. One of the first podcasts that I recorded was uh, what are the effects of being raised by a narcissist? Go back and look at that podcast. So what happens if you have somebody in your life or multiple people, but in your close proximity in your world, who is draining you, who's uh, moving you towards burnout, who is taking all your time, effort, energy, and resources and not treating you properly? Literally, they are harming you in some capacity. If I drain you of your life energy, as it were, I'm harming you. I am taking your oxygen mask, so to speak. I'm, I'm standing on your emotional oxygen tube. And so nobody's going to benefit. So <laughs> what happens when I finally determine that I have somebody like that in my life? I have to begin to make a change. If I wait for them to make a change, how long do you think I'm going to be waiting? Tell the cows come home. <laughs> then, then, then I've got cows and pigs and dogs. I'm like a farmer in the dell. So, and the cheese, the what are the mice take the cheese or whatever? See, I'm left with nothing. I end up with Mother Hubbard's cupboards. So, okay, so we started um, last time. We were looking at what are some of the key hindrances to being, to being able to implement applicable and appropriate boundaries. Boundaries, boundaries that fit. And what I mean by that is you have to view relationships on a scale of 1 to 10. It's not either or. It's not black or white. If you know anybody that is um, that has borderline personality disorder, that looks that is as stable as a Richter scale on a daily basis. See, bipolar disorder is very different. That's a biological um, disease, quite frankly, and you'll be able to plot that like a woman's menstrual cycle. There will be a predictability to that as far as bipolar or what used to be called manic depression. Okay. Emotional reactivity looks like a Richter scale throughout the day or throughout the week. That is not biochemical. 
That is not genetic. That is emotional, and it typically has to do with stuff in the past. You're not responsible for what you're given, but you are responsible for what you do with it. My message to those that have borderline personality disorder is this. It's time to get serious and time to deal with it. You are punishing people around you if you are in close proximity to people that can't get away from you. And you probably know that. So, so you need to get serious about it. I would start by going on to SurvivorSupport.net, starting to listen to my previous podcasts. Why? Because you need to begin to understand the effect you're having on other people. Your pain is legitimate until you begin to negatively impact somebody else. Then everything stops. Because, or why? Because you now have gone from being oppressed or hurt to being hurtful or an oppressor. The moment you become an oppressor, your pain doesn't count anymore. Now, of course it counts. After you, after you stop, after you deal with it, because what you're doing is you're cutting yourself some slack to be hurtful. Well, if you know what it's like to be hurt, why are you going to dish that out? There is no excuse. There is no excuse not to do what Proverbs chapter 1 and chapter 2 says. So 3,000 years ago, Solomon listed what our responsibility is. In Galatians 6, Paul talked about, and we referenced this in a previous podcast, he talks about what our responsibility is, or the importance of owning our responsibility. Each man should carry his own load. The Greek word for load is knapsack. The old-fashioned uh, pole with a uh, bandana on the top, we referenced that in a previous podcast as well. The goal of our lives should be, so the goal of counseling is everybody owning one knapsack, no more and no less. That's different than a burden. We are to bear one another's burdens. That word is a boulder. Through no fault of their own, it's too big for them, it's come upon them, it's the death of a spouse, it's natural disasters, it's uh, things, uh, the death of someone close to them, that's a burden. They're not intended to carry that alone. And if you have one of those, you yourself, if you're wrestling through that, you actually need to let people come along and carry, help you carry that, though they can't take it off, of course, because you're having to go through it. So I, I do a talk, by the way, called Knapsacks and Boulders. When, when I get both of those kind of confused, when I don't allow someone to help me with the boulders in life, I'm going to get in trouble. I'm going to burn out. I'm carrying more than I need to. With the knapsacks, if I'm carrying more than I need to, I'm going to get burned out. But there's a difference because the knapsacks have to do with somebody else's responsibility. Responsibility to do what is right, just, and fair. That is the key to everything. Everybody owning their own stuff, meaning everybody doing what is right, just, and fair. Is there ever a reason, is there ever an excuse to not do the right thing? There's not. We always, always, always have to do the right thing. Is there ever an excuse to not be just? No. Is there ever a reason to be unfair? No. So regardless of circumstances, people, place, and things, it doesn't matter. I always am called to do what is right, just, and fair. If I ask God for wisdom, he will give that to me, and then I will know how to do that because that has to do with how I treat other people. So, what are the hindrances? We're going to review a little bit. What are the hindrances to implementing applicable boundaries, meaning goodness of fit, that it matches? I want to match the boundaries. I mean, think about fences. Think about, yeah, think about fences. You have different gradations or types of fences, everything from decorative to more semi functional. Uh, meaning this, and keep a dog in, but maybe it's aluminum, and so it wouldn't keep a car out. All the way to think about a prison, and then think about a border wall. Um, these are all different size, different shapes, different purposes. They will match. It doesn't make sense if you ha if you live in a calm neighborhood to put the border wall around your house, right? There, it doesn't fit, but. If you're on a border with somebody that's hostile, if you put in an aluminum fence, it's going to be ineffective. That presupposes the other person is going to cooperate with your aluminum fence. So it has to fit. 
If you have someone on a scale of 1 to 10 that has one, uh, a level 1 degree of selfishness, and we covered this, by the way, in a previous podcast, level 1 on a scale of 1 to 10 is human error, human faults. We all do that. That's where grace comes in. We extend people grace. We extend them the benefit of the doubt. But I need to be able to discern because you can have a selfish pig who at first looks like he's a pretty reasonable person or she's she's nice. Here we use that term. We're not supposed to be nice, by the way. Kind, yes. Nice, no. Um, and we did that on a previous podcast as well. We touched on that. Okay. So there has to be a goodness of fit. Once I determine that somebody is not intending to stop, that they're going to keep going, going with what? Their ego and their selfishness. Once they're no longer going to dial it back, I have to begin to place boundaries or limits. What prevents me from doing so when it starts to become clear? So again, I need discernment. I need to be sure that I'm not making this up. I'm not imagining something. This is now intentional. So if I'm dealing with somebody that is intentionally hurtful, I need to have limits so that I can protect what is important. What's going to prevent that? The very first thing is fear. But unless you risk, you're never going to know what's true. And you could be in this situation in a never-ending cycle forever, for the next two years, for the next five years, Why? Because then a part of you is waiting for that selfish person that's already demonstrated they're benefiting from the status quo, from the way things are. You're waiting for them to make a change. But they don't want to make a change. You have to understand that. That's why they haven't made a change yet. It's not out of ignorance. Most people, unless they're brain dead, and my guess is you're not thinking about a brain dead person. You're thinking about a person that's pretty capable. And so they really get it. They can discern. They can see the look on your face when they're hurtful. It's in those situations, especially with someone that turns, can turn it on and turn it off, that's the kind of person we're talking about. Okay? So why, what's going to prevent it and why should you? Because unless you risk, you're never going to know what's true. So you could be doing this forever. If you think through this, How are things going and would you be okay as New Year's Eve rolls around five years from now that you're in the same situation by degree? My guess is a part of you is not going to be okay with that. Unless you risk, you're never going to be able to close the anxiety gap. Part two of the uh, warthog assessment. Go back and uh, view that one. I talk about the anxiety gap. Where does the majority of anxiety come from? It comes from the disparity between what is and what I'm hoping or I'm working towards, but what probably isn't going to be. So I have to finally come to terms with that. So if you're anxious, you may likely have an issue of boundaries going on. So you have to, you have to address this. You are also fearful of loss in the sense, loss of what could be or what might be. And that often, oftentimes is what's going on. You're focusing on the brief times where that person's fun, where that person is nice. And you're telling yourself on some level, that's the true person. The rest isn't. So I know what, he's, I know what he or she like is like 90 to 95 to 98% of the time. But after all, we've had such good times for a small per- percentage. And the question is this, what is true? How much more evidence or information will you need to finally know that it's time to start focusing on the majority of the information he or she's giving to you as far as their behavior? If a person is 98% selfish and 2% nice, using that term, what do you think they're doing? Who do you think they are? What do you think they're about? And why do you think they're doing what they're doing? The 2%, ready, is only to keep you sucked in because they're really smart. The 2% is not them and the 98% we excuse away. That's why you're stuck in this. And the flip side of hurt, so you're being hurt, you're being demeaned, you're being disrespected, devalued. The flip side of hurt is anger. 
the anger will trigger the fight. You're in the fight flight syndrome. Anger will trigger adrenaline and your anxiety is not anxiety. All things being equal, your anxiety is adrenaline. You are not fearful. You are angry and you don't know it. You're detached. You are separated from your anger and therefore you don't have that which is designed to help you implement boundaries. So that's why you are stuck with that person that has given you plenty of information about what they're all about, yet you are reworking that. You are reframing their selfishness as their inability to be any other way. Seriously. Are they brain dead? When you see them in other contexts around other people, when people come over, can they suddenly change? Well, guess what? They could be that way around you. Well, why aren't they? Why do you get the leftovers? Why do you get the crud? Why do they give the good stuff to the people outside the home? But guess who you get? You get uh, Dr. Jekyll and Mr. You get Mr. I don't know, whichever one of them, right? Or Mr. Hyde. You get the Mr. Hyde. Everybody else thinks, oh, and they might even say this. You're so fortunate. I wish I had a mother like that. Right? And you're thinking if they only knew. Of course. That's part of you is trying to tell you that. <clears throat> okay. Uh, but again, why aren't you implementing boundaries? Because of fear. Of, fear of what? Of what could be or might be. And that's why this is within the context over the overall context, this talk, on the issue of grief and loss. A part of you is trying to stay away from, understandably so, but a part of you is trying to stay away from the reality that is never going to be. And that would put you into the grief and loss process. So part of you is staying away from that. And therefore, what, have you ha what do you have? You have what you have in the current day. So fear of loss will keep you stuck. Fear of what might have been. How about this? If only, and do you find yourself saying this? If only given enough time, patience, and understanding, it might be different. The fear of ending too soon. What if I, if I had just hung in there long enough? More than likely, you've hung in there long enough. Now, am I suggesting you go and you divorce the person right now? No, I'm not suggesting that. What am I suggesting? I'm suggesting you read Proverbs chapter 26, 27, and 28, a 3,000 year old book, The Wisdom of Solomon, and look what it says to do with the fool. Look what it says not to do with the fool. I recommend you implement that. Separating is a very important and reasonable step. Why? Because you need to preserve yourself. You need to begin to implement truth or allow truth to do its work. And you need to become stable. You need to get oxygen into your soul. And if it ends up in divorce because the other person does something stupid or foolish, and trust me, nobody stays the same when selfishness is building. That's the magic of separation. If you do it right, which means you're going to focus on yourself in a healthy way, you're going to continue to do the right thing, then guess what's going to happen to the selfish person? They're not going to stay the same. They are going to begin to change. They'll either come to their senses, but not in a prodigal sense. They're either going to realize that they're heading in a direction now that's going to cause them pain, or selfishness is going to continue to grow, meaning they're either going to value you, your, your face value, <laughs> The value of you will either increase now that you have placed distance, so they will, will realize what they're at risk of losing, or they will continue to grow in their selfishness and they won't humble themselves. And selfish people have a never-ending appetite to satiate their impulses in one way or another. And in this day and age with the internet, if I'm talking to a lady, if I'm talking to a woman whose husband is, uh, has become a pig, trust me, I'll tell you what he's going to do. He's going to get into porn in some capacity. And if he gets into porn, there's a strong case to be made that he is now unfaithful because he's going to get into some dark stuff very quickly. And that'll be for another program. But I can make a very strong case for that. Okay. Um, another aspect of the fear, fear of being 
uh, the one to blame for ending the ending things, for ending the relationship. If you have come out of, let's say that you've been previously divorced, oftentimes the stigma of that to yourself or to your family, I've known of a number of situations where somebody is in their third marriage and they just say, you know what, I, I can't get divorced anymore. And so they consign themselves to misery. Uh, I don't read anywhere in scripture that you are to consign yourself to misery. As a matter of fact, look at the woman in the well, if you're familiar with that story in the New Testament. Jesus comes along, there's a woman that's at a well doing manual labor in the middle of the day by herself in the Middle Eastern sun. You know there's an issue. Women didn't do anything by themselves, especially, you know, they canned, they cooked, they sewed, everything together. And as a matter of fact, a lot of women now are isolated. But she was purposely isolated. Why? She lived in a small town and she was tired of being the talk of the town. She had had multiple failed marriages and now she's living with a guy. And even though that was a non-Jewish situation, they still lived in a small town. And so she just wanted to be alone. By the time Jesus finished talking to her, her soul was revived. She had oxygen in her soul. And it changed everything. Suddenly the shame left. All the baggage left. We're not told what she did. She goes into the city and tell, says, come, come, tell, uh, come see the man that told me everything I've ever done. Well, that's why she was by herself. She was tired of people talking to her. So something so dramatically changed on the inside for her that the shame fell off. And I have no doubt that as she walked through that door, when she went back home to the guy she was living with, there was a change. We don't know what that change is, but I have no doubt she wasn't going to settle for less anymore. We will continue looking at what are some of the things that keep us stuck, including we're going to look at mistaken beliefs that will keep us stuck and keep us resisting and fearful of implementing boundaries. And we'll be back on the other side of the break. Are you or someone you know a survivor of abuse and wondering where to turn for trustworthy help and insight into the effects of such abuse? Ever wish you had access to a resource that could help you continue your progress in healing? Survivorsupport.net is that resource. Developed by John Euler, a seasoned therapist with years of experience working with sexual abuse survivors, Survivorsupport.net is a one-of-a-kind resource to help you understand the impact of abuse and to help you understand the nature of those who harmed you in order to help you gain clarity and continue healing. If you are interested in speaking with John Euler about your situation or in having John conduct a consultation or a training for your church or organization, Survivorsupport.net serves as a convenient method of contacting him. Our program, Journey to Healing, is made possible through the generous donations of viewers like you. There are many opportunities and needs that Survivor Support is attempting to meet, and your monthly support or one-time gift would be extremely helpful as we seek to meet those needs and opportunities. Simply visit SurvivorSupport.net and you will see the link to donate on the homepage. We thank you. <laughs> 